Hi, it's Rory from CounsellingTutor.com and I'm with Bob Cook from the Manchester Institute for Psychotherapy. Yeah. Hello. Hi, hi Bob. Um, I'm in my home town of Manchester again, talking to Bob and talking about object relations. I know a few of you on the channel have asked me to do a video about object relations, so I've come to see Bob Cook today, who's incredibly knowledgeable uh, about psychodynamic theory and we're going to talk and discuss object relations. So, Bob, Hello. what is object relations? That's a good question, as it's a particularly um, obscure word, I often think. Right. Um, it was first used in the um, psychology, psychotherapy literature by the godfather of modern-day psychology, psychotherapy, which of course is Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud. He doesn't. He don't have to look too deeply before he comes up to pop. <laughs> and um, when he 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 termed the word object, he was talking about uh, not only the significant other, that would be the mother, the father, the grandfather, the brother, the sister in the client's family, but it's actually talking about uh, the inanimate objects like a bus or. Uh, you know, a dog or a cat. The object could be any other. Right. Right. In Freud's terminology. Okay. Um, as the psychological psychological literature developed, um, and today we've got object relations therapy. Um, Sheldon Cashton, who wrote one of the probably the most prominent book on object relations theory stroke therapy. Mm -hmm came out with a book in 1990 where he talked about object relations therapy where the object is referred to as a significant other. Yeah, that's different from Freud's version of object. So, so there's been a movement from Freud's ideas where it could be absolutely anything yeah. to it being more precise and being maybe a caregiver or a significant Correct. individual in Correct. somebody's life. Correct. And that's usually the term um, that we use when we talk about object relations therapy. Mm -hmm. um, so what happens is, in the development of the psyche, the child internalizes the other, which is the object. Right. So the mother, the father, the sibling. So yeah, etc. Right. Right. So if we look at the development of the child, and let's look at psychodynamic development. Okay, the so this is, this is psychodynamic theory. This is really right. in the remit of the psychodynamic Yeah, yeah. Margaret Marler. Right. Okay. Now she talked about one of the most important parts of child development is the time between one and a half and three and a half which we called, uh, sorry, which she called individuation separation mm -hmm. period. One and a half to three and a half. Okay, and that period would be where the child is be becoming autonomous, maybe? Correct. Starting, yeah, starting to find their own life and their own experience. Yeah, and the major goal in the completion of this period is what Marla called constant Sorry, my turn. Object constancy. Right. Now, if I'm, if I'm, I've, I've done a little bit of study on this before I came today, <laughs> um, which is always a dangerous thing, a little knowledge, but object constancy I, I'm getting as consistent attention or caregiving. Correct. Yes, from the caregiver. Yes, yeah, so you've internalised the constant mother. So... Margaret Marler split up the individuation separation period into periods of what is called infant practicing. So in the search for individuation or object constancy, the infant would practice throughout this time uh, the, the uh, movement away from the self in search of autonomy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then at the same time is internalising the object at a constant level. So that, in other words, the mother or the caretaker 
is always there in the psychological makeup of the infant, not only in um, constant, you know, day, you know, but also in terms of stress. So under stress, they have a constant internalized other in their head. Okay, so it, it sounds to me, I know we talked off camera earlier about the gym and your cricket character, this notion that as the child's separating, they carry with them a, a Jiminy Cricket character, if you watch Jiminy Cricket, he sits on the, the shoulder of Pinocchio, <laughs> telling him the right thing, soothing and giving sound advice and, and, and this sounds like the object you're talking about, it sounds yeah. like this is the caregiver, so when the child is under stress, then they revert back to that caregiver, yeah. it's almost like a mechanism of soothing. Correct, a good enough other. A good enough other. And Winnicott's, Winnicott's term for this is a good enough mother. Right. Now, of course, you inter internalise as well the father, the parent, the siblings, the immediate family. Um, in object relations therapy, it's, it, it's that family that we're referring to. Right. So, it, so when we're looking at specific therapy, object relations therapy, which is a specific type of psychoanalytical Correct. therapy, that the work would be about what, helping the client to identify initially what that caregiver was? Yes, and certainly in transaction analysis psychotherapy, which is a deri derivative of psychodynamic therapy, there would certainly be the emphasis on the client understanding those dialogues, the, um, the consistent object, yes. and also the negative other or the negative objects that they may have internalised at the same time. Okay. Because the problem comes, of, of course, is not with the internalisation of the good enough object, but of course if there's a break in the attachment process there, if there's a loss, if the um, object, if you like, is unhealthy in terms of if they're an abuser, Yes. Or if they shame the person, or if they humiliate sure. the infant. So the object constancy has to happen. Yes. Yeah, part of psychological development. However, if the object is, in inverted commas, unhealthy or abusive, then you will internalise that object. Yes. So, in, 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 so if you've got a very abusive caregiver, when you're stressed out or you're in a position where you need soothing, instead of the soothing, you will you will be giving yourself those negative Correct. ideas from your past. Correct, and that makes up predictability, consistency, stability in terms of identity forming. So this this is about the formation of personality and how we are in yeah. the world. Yeah. Yes. And the early objects that make up that personality. Sure. So if you've got a healthy object relation, and it's interesting, isn't it, that the, the, the psychology she talks about talks about mother, but I guess, am I right in thinking that that would be any caregiver? Correct. Right. But he, but he was probably a man of his time and, and, and chose, chose the mother figure. Correct. But it could be any, any significant caregiver. Yeah, Cashkin talks a lot about that. Right. So if there's a, a positive caregiver, and as, the, as someone gets older, and they get stressed, they're more likely to be able to self-manage, self-soothe, and, and find a balance in their life. Correct. By drawing down this historical, or drawing up this historical object, this historical caregiver, that's Correct. like a Jiminy Cricket figure. Correct. What happens when the opposite happens, when the caregiver is a negative force, mm -hmm. and when the person's stressed, they're pulling this negative force in. What, what's liable to happen to an individual? Well, the opposite of the healthy object. Yes. In other words, you will have a negative um, object. There'll be negative words. There'll be mm -hmm. a negative sense of self-image. Mm -hmm. There'll be a neg negative sense of self. Yes. And your self-esteem will be low. Um, and there'll be more what we call uh, unhealth or pathology. Yes. And I, I think, I don't know if you see this in your practice, but... I, I've had it in my practice where clients have said to me, 
when they've when they've done something wrong, they bring in that significant other from their past, yeah. almost like a club wielder to beat them up a bit more. Correct. To say I, I was told by my father, my mother, or, or my par partner, but maybe we're looking at more historical stuff than that with object relations, and and they almost seem to make an ally of this person to give themselves a difficult time. Correct. So what's the therapist's role in this? Well, now we come to really the, uh, and we can't really talk about object relations without talking about this phenomenon. Right. Okay. Now we're really talking about the concept of transference. Yes. Now, this becomes very important when we talk about object relations. Yeah. So, by the mechanism of transference, and that is the transferring over the image, feelings, behaviour, Onto the other, that's the therapist. Right, the presenting past. The presenting past, yeah. Yes. Um, that's the phenomenon of transference. <clears throat> Through the mechanism of transference, the person can internalize the good object of the therapist. Right. Yeah, which will pr provide protection, idealization, stability, consistency, close proximity to um, mediate, if you like, between the good and bad objects. Yes. So that the client can achieve some sense of stability, consistency and empowerment. So it very much sounds like the therapist is another Jiminy Cricket character who comes along <laughs> and, and to want to, to a better yeah, word. Yeah, I quite like that. Yeah. And, and <coughs> mediates between this historic object that may be uh, giving the, the clients a bad time and steps in, in between them almost like a, a, a referee. Correct. But, but isn't, this, isn't there something about the fact that this, this the therapist is giving positive attribution to the client? Yeah, yeah there's, there's a couple of things here. Eric Byrne, who is the founder of Transaction Analysis Psychotherapy, coined a term which he called interposition psychotherapy where exactly what you just talked about occurs that the client through the mechanism of transference internalizes the psychotherapist as the good object that will mediate between the internalized healthy and unhealthy objects of the client and in that mediation may well give permission permissions to the client to be able to, um, if you like, uh, find a voice uh, in the conflict between the negative and healthy objects. Yes. Be able to... <coughs> now there's, there's, there's a, a, a wonderful quote by Rogers who talks about the client being trapped in a prison wanting to be heard knocking on the prison walls, you know, in a, in a metaphorical sense, not literally yeah. in prison. <coughs> and it sounds to me like this, the, the therapist is, is helping the client get a voice and, and be who they want to be, develop themselves. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and um, Cohort, who is one of the most foremost psychoanalysts, who broke away from Freud mm -hmm. in the early 1950s, and it was around the time of Rogers, um, and formed what was called the self psychology movement mm. in the uh, United States, calling three transferences um, idealizing transference, the merging transference, and the mirroring transference. And through those particular transferences, then the um, it's the same again. The client internalizes the therapist, mm -hmm. and the the uh, protection mechanism through idealization, the mirroring of the good attributes of the therapist, all help the um, client to develop a more robust sense of self mm. um, through the mechanism of transference. Oh, Incredible, that isn't it? And that and a lot of transference <coughs> is subconscious, isn't it? Really, in the realms of unconscious. I mean, 
Uh, Freud, way back in his first book on hysteria, when he started to develop the ideas of transference and the use of transference to help this internalised process in terms of object relations that we're talking about, went as far to say, to say a psychoanalysis in terms of a curative, curative effect won't, ha won't happen without transference. Oh, so then there needs to be in this particular model mm -hmm. the notion that at some level the therapist is internalised to the client. Correct. Otherwise, as Eric Byrne said, speaking 60 years later in his model, mm -hmm. you would simply be having an adult to adult chat. No cure will happen. Oh. So it has to be more than just a, just a, a chat. It has to yeah. be. So what, what, what kind of attributes does the therapist need to show to develop this significant other object? Stability, mm -hmm. that means always being there for the client. Yes. Consistency, you know, in terms of mood swings that they actually are providing a nurturing, nurturative support. Sure. Uh, permissions, where they are giving healthy permissions to the client. Mm -hmm. And modelling a healthy enough other. Yes. So, so all the kind of things that, that, that therapists should be doing. Should be doing. Should be yeah, doing, should be and that's the that's the key thing here. Should, yeah, be, should doing be doing of of maybe in terms of, of consistency, turn up on time, turn up prepared for the session. Yeah. In terms of of giving permission, allowing the client space to explore the material. Correct. Yes. And of course, again, Coward um, came up with the discovery of what he called um, empathy. Uh, a quality which he said that all good in inverted commas, I don't know what he meant by good, right. by the way, psychoanalysts needed to develop mm -hmm. the ability to get into the skin of the client. Yes. In the service of achievement. Yes. And that will help the, help develop the mechanism of transference. Yes. See, it's all going back to this development of transplants through basically the unconscious mode, really. So, <coughs> it's interesting you talk about uh, thera therapeutic entombment. Sometimes when I'm teaching, I talk about internal frames of references. I, I don't think they're too far apart. No. Really. I don't think they're too far apart. <coughs> so, so, we got to the stage where the, the client's in therapy, the therapist is providing this other object. Yes. Oh, what happens when the therapy comes to an end? How do, how do both the parties know that this new object, this new Jiminy Cricket character, is established well enough to work post the therapeutic engagement? So, at what point does the therapy finish? Well, let's use Eric Burns' uh, language of transaction analysis to give some clues into um, the answer, here, or at least the response here. Now he would say, when the um, client has developed a robust, robust enough sense of adult over time, mm -hmm. so that under stress, they can organize and regulate their emotions so they can stay in the here and now. Yes. Right. So they're not catapulted back to the past. That's right. And that negative object, and hearing yeah. that negative object yeah. speaking to them as they may be a, a small yeah. children, yeah. but they can they can work with hearing their responses. Right. And and I guess in TA theory, access their adult ego state. Correct. Yeah. And Cashton speaking about object relations therapy, or Kernberg talking about psychoanalytical borderline theory, would talk about. Um, the integration of the negative and positive objects so that the person um, can, call, can mediate between the two and, de and develop their robustness of self. Okay, so know the difference between that negative voice and yes. positive voice yeah. and be able to, in their own way, say actually that is the past, the here and now is completely different. Correct. And, uh, and in that, has developed the 
ability of spontaneity and the freedom of action in the present instead of being stuck in some archaic uh, child ego state. Yeah, so it's a bit like it's like a bit like the time machine, isn't it? In a way, they're <laughs> they they're, they're kind of in, yeah, in, in in the time machine, you know, stuck it stuck it stuck in the past with the feelings and thoughts and and and, and behaviors of the past, and then the therapist sort of helps them to kind of come to the the here and now into into the present time. And, and and regulate themselves and be able to have that internal dialogue. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Well, I thought that was really fascinating. I've learned so much. It's not a subject I have to be honest to say that I know a lot about, and I'm just so grateful for spending this time with you, Bob. I've I've learned so much, and I'm sure the people who are going to watch are going to learn equally as much. So. Bob Cook, thank you. Thank you. And as always, to you out there, thank you for watching. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.